who is going to be talking about the RFQ and RFP process and you know how to write one of those winning proposals. How do you how do you actually do that? And what are some of those components? And as we go through that today, you're going to have questions. Please, um, because Kunjin is trying to follow um, his, you know, like step by step for you. And this is going to be recorded. So please, can you just um, all of the questions to chat? And then I'll go ahead and interrupt him um, at a certain break point so that we can ask questions about what is going on. But we want to make sure that we welcome every single one of you that's here today. We're so thankful and grateful for you for being here and for trusting us to serve you. Um, we are here, um, we, you know, this wouldn't be happening without the sponsorship of USDOT, uh, the Small Business Transportation Resource Center Northwest Region, and Lily Keefe, the director, is here with us today, and then also from the Port of Seattle. I'm not, um, Marnie, I've not seen if Tamika is, no? Okay, so Lily, I'm going to go ahead and, and kick this off to you so that you can go ahead and do your welcome to everybody. I was just going to say good morning because it's so gloomy out there. So I just want to say good afternoon, everybody, on behalf of USDOT, Northwest Small Business Transportation Resource Center. I'd like to welcome a session, a second session of the Advanced Virtual Port Gen work Workshop. I saw some familiar faces, but for some people who don't know us, we are a USDOT Small Business Support Service. We're funded through the cooperative agreement between Economic Alliance, Snohomish County, and USDOT Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. Good name. Just uh, again, like what we do, we provide technical assistance, business consulting, um, they're all free, um, training, uh, bonding assistance, and financial assistance. And uh, with our team is Tanya Moda and Jessica. Wave to the camera so people know if they need some help. And um, of course, I just want to say thank you for Port of Seattle for trusting us to manage this program, I mean, this workshop. And also special thank you for our partner, uh, Procurement Technical Assistance Center, Marnie Tyson, and also Daryl. Daryl's not here, but Marnie is here. So thank you. And um, just want to uh, let you guys know if you uh, need the recording or the PowerPoint, feel free to contact us because some people probably stay just for like, you know, first half um, of the session, um, just let us know. Thank you again, have a good day. Okay, and then I received a chat um, from Tamika. So Tamika is here. So I'd like to welcome Tamika from the Port of Seattle. Oh, you know what, we can't, oh, there you go, okay. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And again, thank you, uh, Lily, Tanya, Jessica, Marty. Uh, my name is Tamika Thornton. I am the DBE program manager in the diversity and contracting department with the Port of Seattle. Um, definitely appreciate everyone taking uh, time out of their busy schedules. I know a lot of you are actually uh, business owners. Um, so again, taking this time out to be a part of this workshop and gain uh, even more information uh, to help not only yourselves, but your business is definitely um, valuable and we appreciate it. Again, thank you. And if you have any questions regarding as we move along the workshops and opportunities with the Port of Seattle, by all means, reach out to myself and our team. So again, thank you, Lily, Tanya, Jessica. All right, thank you, Tamika, for being here. Um, we really appreciate the fact that the Port of Seattle is, um, you know, that they are, they are here. They're active with their workshops and they're part of those workshops and we're <laughs> thankful for that. Okay, so without any further ado, Kunjin Dal is gonna be talking to us today about, well, Kunjin, maybe this might put a little bit of, um, you know, weight on your shoulders. The perfect, no, <laughs> the winning RFP, the, the winning RFP, right? How to respond to those so that we have a, a better than normal chance of getting those. So welcome Kunjin and um, we look forward to learning from you today. Thank you, Tanya. Hi everyone, my name is Kunjin Deo and uh, uh, I appreciate that you have come to this forum. Uh, we are grateful to Port of Seattle and Northwest uh, SBTRC for hosting this event. Uh, a and &E, uh, procurement is something I love. I've been doing it for many years 
and supporting small business has been my goal. Uh, so let's take it from here. How do you win an a &E contract? So the first session is how do you obtain the small contracts first? Uh, in order to win contracts, it's best to know the rules. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this just lays out uh, the a &E track uh, that Port of Seattle uh, is hosting and the dates. So today is November 5th, and we're gonna talk about RFQ, which is qualification and RFP. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in order to win at a game or to make a good meal or whatever, knowing the rules of uh, the components of the game or the recipe are important. So that's why I have the slide that even though you might think, oh my gosh, rules, but rules are what may help you win the contract. And the saying out there is from uh, Einstein. So great minds have put themselves out there saying, know the rules first. And the rules that we're gonna talk about are A and E, and what is RFQ and what is RFP. Once you know the rules, you can play much better. Let's go to the next slide. So the first question was, what is an a and &E? And it sounds intuitive. Uh, some of the laws are clear. Some of them are laws. And as most laws, not very clear. Uh, but RCW 3980 talks about contracts for a and &E services. And it defines architects, engineers, land surveyors, and landscape architects in these RCWs. So if you are one of these professionals, I encourage you to look at these RCWs. Uh, they are hyperlinked. So once you get a copy of this, uh, you don't have to go looking. You can just click on any of those hyperlinks and you'll be able to see it. Uh, making sure that you fit the right mold is important because if you're doing work that is not considered architect by the agency, uh, you may be knocking on the wrong door. So make sure that you are aligned with what the RCW says. And also be aware that oftentimes uh, procuring agency may also make mistakes. So my suggestion to you as a small business would be, don't just look for architects. If you're an architect, also look for say planning contracts, which are not governed by the a &E track. So that's just a small bit of information because the same kind of work may go through an a &E track with a small twist, it may go through the planning track, which is not covered by a &E. So th those are typical RFPs. So make sure when you register with a company or an agency, you're registering on the a &E track as well on, on the planning side. Uh, it'll give you more opportunities to succeed. Same with landscape architects. Once you're registering here, Make sure you also register on the construction side because it could show up on the construction arena. Let's go to the next slide. So as I said, uh, knowing the rules are important and I've highlighted some of the major rules. So one of the rules that the agencies have to follow is they have to publish any any work they're going to do in advance. Now that's easier said than done. It may be that it's a large project and it gets published as a notice by itself or an agency might, and this is what many do, uh, might publish something at the beginning of the year. And I'm not saying January 1, beginning of their budget year, beginning of a particular month, but they might do it annually. So that's all that the RCW really requires is that the notice should be published at least once a year. So my, my suggestion to you would be 
that if you're targeting an agency, find out when they publish it. And that list, that publication is not, it's an estimation, but it'll give you an idea of what work is gonna come up and where you might play a role. So that's what 3980030 talks about. Uh, can we click on that please? And just to show people that it does take you to the RCW. It should open a, a browser. Okay, just take it from me that it does work. Uh, maybe uh, on the Zoom, it's a little bit of a challenge, but it opens a browser and goes to the RCW. Uh, the next RCW talks about how firms are hired by agencies. So it says that any services must be procured by statement of qualifications. So a question that you might have been asked already, and uh, I don't know if that question has been asked, how many of you are already participating in any procurements and how many of you are very new to this uh, arena? Can you try and answer this question? Just a couple left. Anybody else? Gonna close it in one, two, three. Okay, so there's at least one beginner. So it makes sense for me to uh, go through the very motions from the very uh, scratch level. So I'll cover the beginners and people who are in the intermediate and experienced, just bear with me or add to it from your own experience what you have seen. So thank you for participating in the poll. I'll go back to the slides. Tanya, can we have the polls out of the way? Still on the screen. It should be closed. I don't have any polls up now. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Is it still showing on your screen, Kunji? Yeah. Oh, just hit the X on it in the top right corner. Okay, cool. Okay, so what does uh, submission of statement of qualification means? So it's different from other forms of procurement where you submit an offer and a rate. Here, no rates are being submitted all the agencies have to do is engage the firm that has the best suitable qualification. Uh, your qualifications are your professional qualifications, the work that you have done in the past, uh, the projects that you have completed successfully. Those are the qualifications you want to exhibit. Uh, the next codes that you are providing services for the value of contracts you have done in those areas, the agencies you have worked for, the complexity level of those uh, projects that you have completed. And uh, if you have any performance data, then that strengthens your qualification. The RCW also requires participation uh, by minority and women owned and veteran owned firms. There's not a stipulation of a level of participation. So my suggestion to you would be, if you are one of these firms, you should ask the procurement agency, the procuring agency, how are they fulfilling this requirement so that you can participate through these channels. These are your channels, uh, good channels, if you are, if you do belong to one of these uh, classifications, 
And I encourage you to speak to the procuring agency and encourage them to abide by the RCW. You have to sometimes do that. You have to remind the procuring agency of the RCW because everyone leads a very busy life and sometimes things slip. So once you submit a qualification and the agency finds the most qualified firm, they usually do a, some kind of a ranking and they'll negotiate with the top ranked firm. So that's what item three is about. And item four is just some exceptions for emergency work. Emergency work is a good place to get in as a small business uh, because the agency may be wanting to get an expedited service. And if you have made a network contact with the agency personnel, then you're more likely to be called out. Any questions on this slide? I don't have anything showing up in chat, thank you. Okay, so folks who are attending, if you have questions on a slide uh, posted, we can always come back to it. Uh, the last RCW that's relevant to our discussion today is there is an RCW that calls out that the agency must make a special effort to obtain participation from women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses. So it's stated twice in the R, uh, RCWs, and my suggestion to you would be, uh, if you don't see that happening, remind the agency. Uh, it's not that they don't intend to do it. Sometimes, uh, you know, work goes faster than they can handle and they might miss it, but use these laws to your advantage. So that goes back to my initial slide. If you know the rules of the game, then you can use them to your advantage. And this is one of the rules that could support many of you if you belong to one of these classifications. Questions? Let's any comments? Look. Any comments during this time about what you just heard? I mean, is it easy? Let's, let's ask that question. Is it easy to talk to an agency and say, oh, "Hey, you know, according to RCW thirty nine eighty forty, you know, this is what what it says: all local governments seeking any services must develop a plan." Is it easy or is it not easy? Let's be real about this, folks. When you get out there, what's happening? Yeah, it boils down to networking. Uh, so as a small business, uh, the path to success is networking. You're networking with agency, you're networking with primes. And uh, I, as a procurement officer, have been reminded by firms and I have not taken, um, I have been happy that somebody's reminded me and I've corrected my ways. And uh, I think most procurement and agency of officials want to do the right thing always. So my opinion is if you encourage them to cover these RCWs, they'll listen to you. They will. I have had a new employee in my team one time issue an a and &E procurement as a non a and &E procurement and uh, one of the small businesses called out and said, how's this happening? And guess what was happening? We had a new employee and uh, we didn't pay attention. And uh, that person went off and issued a regular RFP instead of processing it as an A&E. So things happen in life. And uh, if you are keen, it will come through. Uh, yeah, and somebody might take offense to it, but I don't think that's, uh, that's not in Seattle at least. So you're, you are in a place where people want to support small businesses and you're in a good place. That is so wonderful to hear. And thank you for that, um, that reaction to, you know, when somebody had told you about what's going on, um, that, that helps us to understand what we, move, what we need to do to move forward. So you need to talk to people, right? Got to talk to people and you have to tell them because like Kunjin said, there could be, um, it could be just that there's a mistake or a new person. So great information, Kunjin. Alrighty, sorry for the interruption. Oh no, this is good. 
uh, I encourage people to who have experience to speak to those experiences and validate me or contradict me. I'm always Injun. to learn. Injun, I just have a quick question because I work a lot with a &E firms and some of the challenges with the a &E firms are like, because they're part of the design, they probably missed the opportunity to get connected with the prime um, consulting when they're in the design process. Because sometimes, you know, you don't get the information quick enough. Do you have any feedback like or tips on how these firms could have a strategy, you know, if they want to know like what is out there, you know, two years from now and become part of that, those, the design team? Very good question, Lily. Uh, I'll cover a little bit right now and then uh, I'll park it and revisit it towards the end. Um, so any work is, comes off from planning work and every agency boasts about their plans. If you're tracking the plans that these agencies are talking about uh, and they're mostly available on the web, uh, my suggestion to you would be as soon as you see a planning project that you think will lead to an area of work that you have an interest in, start pinging the agency in that. Say, I'm available, I'm ready, I'm willing to perform. And uh, you will get your chance if you, you know, it's, it's the squeaky wheel that gets attended to. So be the squeaky wheel in this, because life is fast. I and mean, uh, the agencies I work for, um, when a project comes through, it'll start slow, but once it catches momentum, there's not a chance to, there's not much opportunity to think. So if you've been putting yourself in the front, somebody will always give you a chance. Uh, there's no rocket science to it, but we'll cover some of it uh, in the next few slides and then we'll revisit this question. Okay. So this uh, slide that we have in front of us, so the a &E procurement is a derivative from the federal practice. Uh, the federal government is very, very precise in its uh, law or procurement regulation making. So they define things a little more clearly. So one thing about federal procurement is they allow for geographic preference. So when you see a federal project and you belong to that geography and you've done work in that geography, state it in your qualification. Ask for preference for having worked in that same geograph geography and tell the procurement person or the project manager uh, through your networking, if they're not giving any preference, ask them. If essentially, if I'm obtaining any a &E service and I find there are three firms at least who have worked in that geography, then my requirement is fulfilled for competition and I would prefer to go to them. There are many advantages of geographic preference and that's why the feds allow it. Uh, familiarity with codes, familiarity with politics, familiarity with demands of the people, all kinds of things. Uh, item B is where the feds actually define what's covered by a &E services. So it's a little more and you can see it starts with program management. So in the RCW arena, program management is not covered. So that's where the flux happen is one set of laws covers a and &E a little more broader than the other. So the procuring agency may not have the same understanding uh, when the laws change. So hence my suggestion that don't just sign up for a and &E. Sign up for things that I'm planning so that you get the program management piece. Or at least you hear about it, which might feed into your work that's down the road. Questions? 
Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is for the absolute newcomer. What is the unique feature of any contracts? So the method of competition is different. And unfortunately, there is no rule book that makes it precise. So various agencies we have noticed will issue requests for quotation, requests for qualification, request for proposals. And I have even seen one which said request for qualification and proposals. So it manifests in many ways, but uh, I'll walk you through the basics. And then you have to understand that things might change uh, depending on how an agency practices. So here we're not just talking about Port of Seattle, I'm talking about government agencies in general. So the first confusion is there are two types of RFQs. So that's why I wrote RFQ versus RFQ, because when people say RFQ, you have to say which one. <laughs> uh, is it request for quotes or is it request for qualifications? So request for quotes is typically not any &E because it doesn't seek qualifications, it seeks price. And most requests for quotes will happen in commodities, but it can happen in services. And believe it or not, sometimes it can happen in small a &E work as well. So uh, be cognizant of it. And uh, if you're tracking the program, then you'll see what's happening. Once you know the people, then basically why would they issue a request for quote is because they think, oh, it's, this is only $3,000. I can get it done quickly. Uh, let me just specify what I want and lowest price wins. Well, it's not compliant with the RCW, but who's gonna fight over $3,000? You wanna win that $3,000, so go for it. Uh, request for qualifications is the right method for a &E and where qualification is the determining factor. And price is only negotiated with the most qualified firms. Uh, having said that, the price has to be fair and reasonable. So just a word of caution that whatever price you offer, you don't want to be uh, losing a contract because the agency sees it as not being fair and reasonable. We'll cover price in greater detail in uh, the next few slides because pricing in a and &E is quite different from pricing in every other business. So that's a very complicated area, but I'll try and simplify it. Some agencies then use RFP for a and &E. And while they call it RFP, what they're really doing is they're trying to hasten the process. So they'll get a packet called RFQ, and then they'll get another packet from you called pricing. And so they have their pricing in hand, and they want to choose the highest qualified firm and then open that pricing packet quickly. Uh, I have personally not done it, but I can see the logic. I also see uh, that things can change over time. So it's not something I have practiced, but I, I've seen other agencies practice it. But just remember that it is actually an RFQ. What they're doing is they're getting the price offer uh, as a separate envelope and they'll only open the one that belongs to the highest qualified firm. So once again, we're just talking rules of the game. So knowing the rules is important and these are your very fundamental rules of a &E contracting. Questions? Any questions from anyone? Um, so Kunjan, I actually have a question because I'm kind of curious about with the RFQ uh, for the folks that are on, you know, on our workshop training, has anybody been, um, I guess, when they took a look at your qualifications, has anybody not made the qualification round? So you were not able to, re, um, to continue on to the proposal round. And you can send that back in a chat. I'm kind of curious about that, if you never made it and, and what was some of the reasons why you never made it because we're trying to figure out 
how we can help um, during that process. Hi, Tanya, this is Tamika. Um, hey. I want to give everyone an opportunity to speak, but um, just being on the agency side and seeing some of the uh, any proposals that have come through, uh, the two things that resonate with me um, and that I've seen is that they do not read the scope as well as the qualifications. So they don't go to the next round because they don't meet the qualifications. Meaning if we ask, you know, list the last two years or three years of experience that you've had maybe uh, doing design work or whatever, they don't have it. They will answer the question, but not give again the information that's asked or two, they will answer the question and it not be related to the scope. So again, they don't move to the next round because they did not really read the information that was asked. And of course, they did not meet the actual qualifications. Um, again, we always tell um, agencies and individuals, please read. Um, and the reason we say that is because that's the reality. A lot of times they don't read the information and so they will bid and then again, they'll say, well, I don't understand what happened or you stated you're looking for inclusion. I'm a woman firm, I'm a minority owned firm. Well, it's not just that, you have to encompass everything. So um, again, reading truly is one of the things that um, I tell firms and individuals to, to pay attention to. Okay, thank you, Tamiko. That's, that's great tips. And uh, a little bit uh, about qualifications is, it's not that you're qualified. There's no minimum qualification. I and mean, there is a minimum qualification, but the choice is not of the minimum is the most qualified. So what an agency will do is they'll say, these three firms are my top ranked. And what they'll do is we'll, they'll negotiate with the first firm. It's very rare for the negotiation to go to the second firm. Most, I think 99% of the time, the first top ranked firm gets the contract. Have has it happened that the first rank firm has not ha gotten the contract? I've been in this business for 30 years only once. <laughs> so it's rare. Uh, so being the right fit, putting your best foot forward, making your qualifications look like it is meant for the job that's av available. Uh, you may never have applied for a job, but if you were applying for a job, you kind of do the same thing. You kind of state what's written in the qualification requirement in your qualifications. If it says you must have a minimum of three years experience, you say, I have a minimum of three years experience. You may have 20 years of experience, but you say that first. That check has the minimum. Then next line, I have 15 additional years of this experience and 20 years of that experience. So try and uh, answer the questions or the contents of the RFQ in the manner it is positioned so that the reader who's written that RFQ understands you very quickly. Uh, so that's just a hint. Any other questions on this? slide. Let's go to the next. So we're talking about small contracts in this session. And one of the ways small any contracts are let, this is the most common amongst most agencies is through a roster process. The RCW allows it uh, Many agencies, larger agencies may create their own. Smaller agencies, I think more than 50 agencies are participating in the MRSC roster. So that's a one-stop shop for you. 
take advantage of it. Um, is everyone aware of MRSC? In fact, uh, item, the last item does say used by 608 Washington public agencies. So that's a huge pool of resource in one spot for all your a &E contracting. Is everyone aware of MRSC? I hear one, yes. Well, if you're not aware, uh, the link is there and uh, it'll take you to MRSC's roster and sign up. And um, my hint would be, don't be very prescriptive with your next code. Be a little more uh, expansive with your next code selection. Uh, the example I give to people, and uh, I don't know if many of you can relate to it, but uh, if you went, uh, if you are too specific, then you know you might lose out on work that is larger than that, where that specific work is just a component. Uh, there's an example that I have used, but uh, I'm not sure this is the right forum, but let's just say you like a fried chicken and you said, uh, the kind of restaurant I want to go to is the KFC kind. Well, it could be that a fancy restaurant also serves fried chicken and then you may start on that opportunity. So think along those lines when you're selecting the next code, be a little more expansive. I know it's a little more work to get uh, solicitations that don't belong to your business but it's better to reject rather than not to have seen it at all. So this is the MRSC roster. Uh, somewhere on this page, I read that they have 608 agencies signed up. So take advantage of that. Not all agencies uh, use, uh, they say show all 608 <laughs> agencies. Uh, thank you for pulling this up, uh, but this is one good one-stop shopping. Uh, the agency I work for does not use MRSC, for example, but so there are different kind of agencies uh, and you have to decide where to focus on, but this is a great resource. I see a comment coming in. Uh, on MRSC, I, I saw a comment being posted. I could answer that question. So the comment is coming in um, from George Frost and he's saying he knows about MS, MS, MRSC and he says you can only get access to about nine agencies for free. Ah. Oh. So the MRSC does survive uh, by making uh, its, its revenue source is by providing services to smaller governments. So uh, if a government agency has signed up with MRSC, uh, then you know, that's the cost of doing business with that government. I'm not exactly very sure of all the rules of MRSC, but uh, it's just an example. Uh, I'm sure Washington State has its own roster uh, and other larger agencies may have their own roster. And some may not use a roster because they uh, use different methods. Uh, but this is the most common method of small a and &E contracting. Let's try the next. Slide. Okay, there's another um, comment from Casey Kramer. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, I think it is only $10 for unlimited agencies. That's a reasonable price. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And my apologies, I did not try and register and see how much they 
charge, but it sounded like a good one-stop shop. So thank you for sharing that it's only a nominal cost for participation. So we're talking about unique features of any contracting. Uh, the big unique feature is the price offer. It's because of the nature of the work, uh, an agency might do time and material or labor rate contract, but many don't, especially if they've been touched by the... I see another common, that nominal cost is not what I... Thank you. We'll, we'll look it up and um, we'll go ahead and post it through the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah, MRC is just an example of a large pool of agencies using it. Uh, other agencies may have their own. I do know that some of the Seattle agencies uh, have both. They do MRC as well as themselves. So you just have to target your agencies and find out what's their method of doing business. So we're talking about unique features of any contracting. Um, price offer is the most unique thing about any contracting. This is where uh, it becomes very challenging. The good thing is uh, WashDOT through Safe Harbor program provides training on how to do price offers and how to invoice once you get the work. So if you've not heard of Washington's uh, WashDOT Safe Harbor program, I've pro provided a link at the very bottom. And uh, it's a pretty extensive program. Uh, again, I'm not an expert in the Safe Harbor program, but I'm aware of its benefits because what happens is any services, you cannot predict how much co it will cost once when you get the work. So it's done mostly as a cost plus fixed fee, occasionally as a lump sum if the work is very, very small and the scope is extremely clear. Uh, they might do lump sum, but the most common method is cost plus fixed fee. And it is quite complicated. Uh, the agency is supposed to reimburse you for all cost, and then you're supposed to have negotiated a fee for that work. Uh, it sounds simple, but cost has uh, got to be audited, that's got to be certified because the, the rule that the agency is following is if they had a time and material contract or labor rate contract, then the profit multiplies as more time is taken in doing the design work. And the agencies feel that they don't have enough control over the design work. The a &E firm has it, so they don't want to be paying for work that took 20 hours instead of 10. Uh, they'll pay you the cost, but the fee will be fixed upfront. So that's the method. Uh, the other challenge is most small businesses don't have an overhead rate that's audited. And my suggestion to you would be attend the Safe Harbor program and learn from them. Um, Safe Harbor starts you off with a standard overhead rate and then you can develop from there but they teach you a lot of things at the safe harbor so it's, it's a real boon to the a &E program as a business owner i understand that you may not have the time or resources to attend the program and uh, it's not difficult to figure it out on your own but the great thing is the safe harbor program gives you a government certified program so if you can do take advantage of it so if the price offer you submitted is on a lump sum basis, then you'll get paid only once after acceptance of work because mostly it's used for very small dollar purchases. 
oftentimes the method is cost plus fixed fee and that requires careful tracking, monthly invoices. So it's a course by itself or it's a few days course by itself. So I'm not gonna try and uh, speak to all of it right here, but the resource is the wash.safeharbor program. I encourage you to look into it. Questions? Any questions, anyone? So Kunjin, I was looking at the um, the website that you were talking about, the MRSC, uh -huh. and I believe that they operate pretty similar to BXWA. So if it's an agency, whether it's state, city, or county agency, then that information, you can access that information. What they're charging for is if you want something from like a private um, company, like hospitals or you know, I, I don't know, like if they're, I guess if they're owned by somebody else, like Kaiser or something, and you wanted to work for them or for, um, you know, Costco, something, then I think you pay for that enhanced services, but they're being paid to host the other stuff like BXWA. Okay. But we'll get the information out to everybody. This is a really good site. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, one-stop shopping is uh, in my mind for a small business, a very uh, great resource. Has anybody attended the Washdot Safe Harbor program uh, from the people who are attending today? I see one answer. Okay, I see a few. So I'm hoping that you have benefit, benefited from it and uh, hopefully you've gotten some washed out work out of it. Um, that's the advantage of taking one of these courses is you get to increase your network. There's a question, how do we ask questions? Uh, you wanna to speak to that, Tanya? If anybody has any questions, what you can do is, um, you can go ahead and type your questions in. We're kind of scrolling through the chats to see what's out there. I think Mizan has a question, Tanya. Mizan. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I have typed in a few of those, but I did not get any response. So I do not know if you guys are looking in or, or I am writing the message in the right place. But regarding the Safe Harbor program, you know, um, you know first, let me start with MRSC. So, um, yeah, I know that, you know, if we have broad mixed score in the search criteria, we get so many of those um, hits in every, say, weekly or daily, it becomes almost difficult to navigate those. So there is a right, I'm, I believe there is a right balance between how many mixed score, how widely you want to cast the net, uh, so that you, are, you get a chance to review those opportunities when it comes. Um, especially if we go like a planning or some kind of environmental studies or things like that as an AE firm, uh, it hits typically. And, and if you are MRSC and you, know, you have the entire state, you get several hundreds of those uh, hit in a day or, you know, every other day. So it's, it's sometimes difficult to, you know, navigate all these things to, uh, that, that gives an opportunity even to miss the right thing that you're looking for. So, that will be one of the difficulty that at least I am having. The second thing is um, regarding the Watchdog Safe Harbor program. It's a good program, but the difficulty here is number one, you know, like especially for the startup companies, smaller companies, it is very difficult to, um, maybe I did not learn the tricks yet, but it is difficult to do all the accounting properly that to get a, um, DCES uh, audited rate structure. And the alternative that WASHDOT has, you know, they, they allow such a low multiplier. You know, it's, it's very low. And it's not reasonable with the industry. If, if they look into what is the A firm average multiplier, they can use that. But they use like 1.2 multiplier. And this is really simply, you know, we don't have other options. This is we have this option. We really appreciate that, and I'm I am personally taking that for my company. I'm taking that opportunity, but I have never done work at that multiplier. And at that multiplier, it will be very difficult for a small business to be very successful. 
And I know that the goal is in a year, you learn all the, you know, process, um, you have the, you know, accounting system in place. They have a pretty good template and they help with that. But I think that it will be also helpful to have, um, you know, better rates, at least an average rate or something below the average, maybe 10% below the average, but not like 1.2. You know, so that's very low, and I do not know whom to say that. You know, I, I did tell um, Watchdog when I was negotiating, you know, I was grateful with them, and at the same time, I was a little bit concerned that at that rate, you know, will be then, you know, it's not very good. Compared to, and if you consider that King County here or, or Seattle Public Utilities, you know, they, what they say that, you know, like if you do not have a government rate, approved rate, show us that how much you have been billing other clients. Show us a track record of what type of multiplier you have been using um, with other clients. So the invoice and everything. So that makes them, you know, that makes it easier for us to, um, you know, justify the rate. Or, or sometimes they will look at it, okay, let's see what is the experience level you have. Uh, what is the, what the experience level the people doing the work has, and they'll compare it with what they're paying with other the growing rates for that type of experience. So those are very helpful for, for the small business or the you know, very small startups. Thank you. Thank you for submitting those uh, ideas. I hope people present have benefited from this real life experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the alternative is uh, if you don't want to go to a safe harbor, you can learn it on your own. You can hire an, uh, an accountant to, to develop your overhead rate. So let's go to the next slide. It, it, we're talking about the next slide, really speaking. So this is what a cost plus fixed fee model looks like. I'm presuming all of you are familiar with it in one way or the other. There are many variations of this, but this is just... Uh, a good starting point. You have labor rate, which is your base rate without benefits. Your benefits are rolled up into overhead, which must be audited. So you could use an accountant, your tax accountant could create one. Um, the Federal Acquisition Regulation actually has a full chapter on how to audit your overhead rate. So your accountant could simply follow it and it's not, uh, it's very intuitive. It's not uh, something uh, too complex. Essentially your expenses must be business related and not entertainment related or something else. Um, then the agency- we've, we've got a question from Christina. I'm gonna go ahead and ask her to unmute. Go ahead, Christina. Yes, hi. Um, I just wanted to kind of comment so um, like with WashDOT also, uh, I had just gotten a project with SDOT and um, I used to do my own accounting through QuickBooks. I, I know a lot of small business owners. I mean, that's what, we don't have a lot of overhead that we can go and have accounting and go hire people to do this. And so um, after um, I had partnered with a larger firm and um, they, it was a requirement. Now, all of a sudden I am on this um, SDOT program and I'm told I have to do this uh, safe harbor. So I get on to safe harbor, it is so complicated. It is up to 18 months or longer. I have to track and, it, and just what safe harbor does is just find out what my overhead is, only overhead. And that 18 month pro program means I have to track everything I do, which means I have to go out and get a time management tracking program that I have to pay for. And I had to go out and get an accountant now outside of me. This is not a very easy program. When you look at the accounting, and I have a math background, and um, I went through pages and pages and pages of, and not every accountant is qualified to do it. This is how complicated it is. So you own, there's a very small amount that actually can do of accountants that are available that can do accounting under these guidelines. Not every accountant will be able to do it. In fact, most don't. So the safe harbor is a very, very incredibly difficult hurdle for small businesses. And it's just to find out my overhead. I don't understand why we, and 
um, kind of what the the reference that um, uh, I forget the gentleman who was uh, speaking just before me who had comments on this. Um, they take your overhead and then they add on what your markup is. And that is, it's actually below industry standard for what I get paid for my, what I actually am worth. What I ch charge my clients as a bottom line, it is below that. And I can't believe that I'm having to go through 18 months of hurdles just to get an overhead cost so that I can already be you know, chiseled down to these really small, small, uh, which like this is a lost um, leader for me. Like I, I have this project, which I was so excited. And now I'm, I'm going to end up losing money by the time I finish finding out what my overhead cost is. I'm having to pay all this extra money. I'm making nothing. So the, this safe harbor, it doesn't give you jobs. All it does is find out what your overhead is at your own cost. And it's really cost prohibitive to do. Thanks. Well, I appreciate you, Christina, for sharing that because I think more voices that speak to it is the only way things will change. Yeah. Uh, my program. And, and what I'm sharing today is what's available. But go ahead. Sorry. No, there's no alternative either. So it's not like you can. I mean, you will be audited and to the standards. That, like I said, even accountants, not all of them are qualified to do it. Christian, please. Lily. I think it's Otto. Yes, please. Go ahead, Otto. My question is, given the, com um, the complex um, safe harbor um, methodology, our, is this series going to include a safe harbor um, forum, maybe bringing someone who's very in-depth knowledgeable about safe harbor to give us an overview. I do share Christina's point of view. I had an overview um, regarding safe harbor. I left totally confused. So when um, Kunjan said, has anyone taken a safe harbor? I did not say yes, because I did not learn anything. So I don't want to criticize the program, but I was more confused and my understanding is it only applies if you get a watchdog project. If you don't have a watchdog project, all that knowledge, 18 months of learning out the window. You can't build normally the way you build for A and E services. And I'm an architect. Only if you procure a watchdog project does this apply. And it's so much hope for you to be paid less than what architects charge in the region. So it doesn't add up at all. So please, um, let's do a class with someone maybe from Watchdogs who's very safe harbor um, experience to give us an overview and what the advantages are. I thank you very much. Atal, we are going to have direct and indirect cost sessions November 12th with Carmel Palomino, who is actually part of the audit team with Watchdog. We're going to have two sessions, so feel free to join, okay? <laughs> Made to order program. Yes, uh, nice questions, nice, uh, nice to hear comments. And I do believe that uh, more and more people question is the way to, for change to happen. So uh, keep questioning it. Uh, it's what we have right now, but there is better, if there's a better method, it will be found out by people speaking up. Um, Rhonda, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to unmute and then you can go ahead with your comment. Hold on for a second. Okay, go ahead, Rhonda. Uh, yeah, we, we've been trying to do work with WashDOT for a long time, and we got into the Safe Harbor program, and it is extremely, extremely time-consuming and burdensome. And I agree that rates are extremely, extremely low for a small business. And the problem we've run into is even when a project comes up with WashDOT, we'll spend time going through all of the exercises, and we never get the project. They'll say our fees are too high. So it's 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 been a problem uh, to do the safe harbor. We finally got out of it, um, but it's still based on all, all on all your records, your overhead, your invoicing, and all of that. And it, you can still be well below the industry standard. 
and there's no guarantee you'll even get a job. Thank you very much for sharing that. I, I do believe that the WashDOT program works wherever DOT funds are involved. So if, if you're working in an area which is not DOT funded, then you have an opportunity to use other techniques. But Port of Seattle is DOT funded, I'm presuming a lot. Uh, SDOT, King County, Sound Transit, so all these major players have a lot of DOT funds. So the investment in Safe Harbor, I'm not justifying the Safe Harbor, but your investment will spread over these agencies that are using DOT funds. I'm probably repeating what you already know, but uh, I did hear that it only applies to WashDOT. It does apply to others that have DOT funds. Uh, again, I also heard that the fee is too low and most agencies will use these factors to develop their fee model. Uh, fixed fee is a matter of negotiation. So my suggestion to you would be that use these factors to develop your fixed fee criteria and use it during your negotiation. I think most agencies might be willing to listen to your fixed fee basis if you have an analyzed uh, presentation on how you arrived at it rather than just a number. That's just a hint. Uh, there is, uh, the agency will do its own math. It'll ask you for an offer. If your offer is supported by an analysis that covers these items that I've listed, uh, then you have a better chance of being able to ne negotiate successfully. Boy, that was a lot of comments on Washington Safe Harbor. So I'm really glad that uh, SBTRC is going to present on direct and indirect costs because that's what uh, the indirect costs, is, the overhead piece. So hopefully there'll be a met new method available. Any questions before we move to the next slide? Mazan is actually posting a question um, to George asking who would be a good contact at WashDOT for DBE support services. Ah, so Tanya, how much time do we have left? Somebody monitoring time. I don't want to. Uh... Anya, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. There's a question from Mazan um, to George, George Frost, and he's asking George, who would be a good contact at WashDOT for DBE support services? Oh, wait. Well, was... Okay, they, there he is. They're inconsistent uh, with their funding. They have fun, they, they're on and off again. I believe they're on again now. And I believe MD, MBDA, um, Linda Womack is the project manager uh, or program manager. Uh, they have the contract now. I'm not sure if it's on track, if it's actually started up again or not. I do know they had an RFP or something out and they selected MBDA to do the, uh, the DBE support services which that means that they try to uh, provide architectural, I mean, accounting and other kind of services at, at low cost or no cost or something. They try to help with those kind of things to help DBE firms. Um, let's say if you're in Safe Harbor or whatever, they, they try to help you with that kind of service. The problem is that again, if they run out of funds, then they stop the service. And so if you're depending on that, you can't get it. Matter of fact, oh yeah, there's the uh, contact information from Lily that you can, um, uh, that's directly to uh, Linda, but the other one is the MBDA uh, uh, information. Uh, 
but it's, it's the Minority Business Development Agency. They're the ones that, my understanding, have that contract or it's just been awarded, so I'm not sure if it's actually in force yet or not. But get on their get on their list, Mazan. You know, call them up and find out if they're going to be helping. So uh, Lily posted Linda Womack's um, email. It's lwomack at cityoftacoma.org. Um, it's in the chat box. So go ahead and make sure that you get a hold of her. Thank you for posting that, Lily. And um, Tina posted that Bobby Forch is a DBE program administrator for WashDOT, and she posted Bobby Forch's um, information on there. So what they'll do is if you contact Bobby, Bobby's going to go ahead and send you to DBE support services. So just go to DBE support services and, and ask them for what you need. You know, if, if you need more training, you know, who in their office is willing to sit down with you and train you on specific um, items because you uh, come from professional services. And then Jessica, can you go ahead and um, ask your question? Kunjin, uh, some of our small businesses are wondering what experience you have that you could provide feedback to them on uh, effective tools that small business can use to um, provide fixed cost negotiations. Fixed fee negotiations. Uh, I don't have tools, but uh, if, if we can have the slide back, the slide is gone. Can we get the slide back, please? Yeah, uh, the next one, number 11. So my suggestion to you would be, uh, if you're a small business or if you're a contractor, consultant seeking work from an agency, try and find out from them, either through public record request or through clarification process, how do they arrive at the fixed fee? Once you have that information, use that information to present your fixed fee requirement based on that criteria. So, some people might balk at the idea of asking this question, but it's a fair business question. If you're competing for an a and &E contract, you are selected as the most qualified, then the firm, the agency will say, submit us your cost proposal. You should ask, okay, I'll give you my cost, labor overhead and other direct for my fixed fee can you tell us how you arrive? Ask the agency, how do they arrive at the fixed fee? And use that set of criteria. I've given you the most common ones that, but there'll be weights. It's a whole different class by itself, but each one of those criteria will have weights. You know, the degree of risk may be high, low, time of performance may be known, unknown, uh, long, short. So there'll be weights assigned and uh, it's a fairly easy process, uh, but asking the agency how they're going to arrive at the fixed fee, because it may be these or it may be a different criteria. And you shouldn't take this as the only method. This is the most commonly used method, uh, but uh, it doesn't hurt to ask and then model your fixed fee based on the agency's model so that you're speaking the same language. It's a fair question. And if you have difficulty asking, you could ask for a review of a prior file. A previous file will reveal you the same thing. So whether it's the same, is whether you ask the question in that particular procurement or you ask for a previous procurement file, you should be able to understand how the agency manages these items. The best would be to ask the agency, how are they going to arrive at fixed fee? What is the criteria they're going to use? What are the weights they're going to use? They may not reveal all of it, but whatever you get, the model your response in the manner that the agency is developing its position. Uh, that's the best negotiation tool you can have is to 
give your answers in the manner that is most connected to the agency's method. Thank you. Let's try the next slide. I, the quick question I have is how much time do I have left? You have until 2.25. Oh, okay, not much, <laughs> okay. So about 10 uh, minutes. Cool, uh, so this slide is an easy one. Uh, most people are probably already aware of it. Uh, an agency may contract for work in these three methods, micro, small, and formal. Micro usually means there's no competition. They can go to wherever they want to go to. And uh, for that, they might maintain a roster or some other tool or just networking. Small usually means very limited competition. Some agencies may say two, some agencies may say three, but usually it's not more than three. And formal is full and open competition. This goes back to knowing the rules and tapping on those rules. So if you know that a micro purchase is coming up and if you have uh, the same qualifications that are needed for that work and if you have networked, you're probably going to get the job. Uh, if it's the small, then you want to be in the competition for that. Uh, let's go to the next slide where I have a little more details on the same subject. So micro purchase is mostly delegated to the project department. So the contracting office may not be involved. That may be down the road. The project manager or the project assistant might be delegated this uh, responsibility. And depending on the size of the agency, micro could be 1,000 or 10,000. Some of the larger agencies have 10,000. So that's a reasonable amount of work right there. And they may not even see task-oriented statements of qualification. They might just say, this is what I need. You got the qualification, go, go for it. And they might arrive at a negotiated value immediately. And more organized departments may have a list of pre-qualified firms. So, not much work in any happens in this arena, I presume. I don't have experience with the larger agencies, but it is a tool that I'm sure many use. Especially the smaller agencies would be using these because they don't have the people to do a full on procurement all the time. So they might get small things done through micro purchase. Let's go to the next one. Small purchases typically would be managed by the procurement office. And uh, again, they might use the roster. The need for competition and small purchase is not very high. It is more than one and probably not more than five. And the value ranges anywhere from 3,000 to 150,000, depending on the agency. So that's a quite a large range. So you should inquire from the agencies that you're tracking for work, what is their threshold for small purchase? And if you find out that it is 100,000, then you know whether it's your area of work or not, or if it's 3,000, then you may want to go somewhere else or it may suit your business. I see some questions, so I'm happy to take them. You can actually unmute yourself to ask your questions. Right, so I am Atua a PFM, I'm an architect. So in, uh, you were right regarding the a and &E as it pertains to architects. You very rarely have an agency that has what I call the micro or sole source procurement, even the state of Washington, I approached them and they told me to help the very small firms grow. They are looking into this, but it will require the legislature to approve because they don't want to do anything illegal. In other words, they can't call me and say, hey, Aro, we have a small project, it's just yours. No, I have to go through the best qualified 
And unfortunately, best qualified almost means 99.9% .9 of the time in very large established firms procuring the work because they have 50 architects and it's just me as one small architect firm. So it's difficult to make that best qualified statement. So my question is, do you have any insight on how to navigate this challenge? Uh, not particularly with Washdot, but from my general experience, uh, if you're a very small business, a smaller agency may not have as much rigidity as Washdot has. They may not have as many big players coming to their doors, but that's just my guesswork. I don't have uh, a hands-on experience on that. Thank you. Small purchases uh, at larger agencies do have a higher threshold and uh, there the competition is equal. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think uh, as the previous gentleman did mention, if the larger companies are going for small dollars, then you have to go to the leadership of that company or agency and ask, what is the philosophy of your agency? Are you going to support small businesses or not? And uh, hopefully, uh, if you manage to present your case, you might see some behavioral change. Because I do know that larger agencies have way many architects that they're training. And uh, they use those trainees to get a lot of contracts. So I don't envy your challenge. Uh, but I think the only path is to ask the leadership of that agency what is their small business philosophy? Because going to the guy who's on the forefront, he's going to be doing what he or she's going to be doing, whatever is being asked of them. They cannot change the rules. So my follow-up question, it's um, I have observed over the years that agencies log into maybe three firms that they love. And they repeatedly let those um, firms procure projects. Um, problem is, other firms that are trying to get in are constantly on the outside looking in. Even though the law says it's, it's open competition, the reality is quite the opposite. Just those very few firms get repeated work while other firms don't have zero. Again, any insight on how to break that glass ceiling? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and there, you know, it's, it's uh, in life, that's what happens. So yes. your chances are either you join them. So you go to this, these companies that have a stronghold on the contracts for that agency and say, hey, how do I get work from you as a sub? Or appeal to the leadership of that organization. I, I like the idea of appealing to the leadership because they all have a commitment to small purchases, small business support. And unless they've heard the difficulty that you're having, telling the uh, front line is not going to open that door. Maybe Maybe can I, can I make a comment here? Okay, because Mizan has a question. Yeah, it's not a question, it's more of a comment on Eto's, um, you know, uh, question that raised based on my experience, you know. Um, I think most of the, you know, the, the agencies when they award a contract, the PM of that agency, what he wants. He wants a team or a project team with, that poses the least risk for him because the project has to be successful. The agency PM is successful only if the project is successful. So they look for the team that is verified. They have worked with them. They have comfortable, they have, comfort, have the comfort and less risk, least risk that the team provides. So in order to do that, you know, that's why the incumbent until unless they screw up something, they get fired. And 
if you see even King County, if you see some of the even bigger job, there is probably 15, 20 companies can do it, but you will see only two or three bits. You know, why? Because most of the people know that they will hire, ultimately hire the incumbent. So that's, that's, a, that's a problem. But on the other hand, what I have seen that if we have the right qualification, if we work with the right people, um, the team that has been working, and if we can team with them, get a small piece of it, you know, that, you know, slowly, like step by step, there is a way to break into that. But you cannot break it immediately because the PM from the King County or other agencies, they, they want to give the job to somebody who has significantly less risk for them. And the way they consider risk is, you know, who has delivered for them in the past and who has consistency. So there is no, very difficult to break that. Very good points. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, uh, I think we've already passed the time, but let's go to the last slide, I think. So I think the discussions have uh, been around these items that I have listed. To me, the best method to get any contracts is through networking because your competition is huge and uh, showcasing your qualification through networking is the best opportunity. Whether you're networking with the agency or the primes, uh, the same things happen. Uh, I'm not adding any value by saying these things, but these are ground realities. You look for sub work on major contracts, uh, track the agency's notification. That is, information is power is here. If you know what's coming up and you're there first at the door, the likelihood of you being considered is high. Join the rosters, update your SOQ after each job. Uh, you know, get the best jobs on your SOQ. And sometimes you may want to just collaborate with others who complement your skills. So you are a small business, another small business uh, who has not competing skills, but complementing skills. And then you present yourself as uh, one company that has two skills rather than one skill. So those are some of the things I could recommend to open that door for you uh, and obtain some success in your line of business. That's my last slide for this session. I think we're out of time, but uh, any pre pressing questions, I'm happy to take them. We have 15 minutes for Q&A, right? No, no, no. We've already gone through the Q&A oh, okay. time. Yeah, we've, <laughs> we apologies. just added it because, because there was um, the questions was happening during your presentation. And thank you for that, Kunjin, because I think that it was important, um, you know,